It's part two of the Reverse Raj campaign, but really it's part one because last time when I played this campaign in Hearts of Iron 4, well, it didn't go that well. We tried to throw off the yoke of British oppression with the plan of going and giving them our yoke, but internal issues caused some major kerfuffles when a rebellion got us very much involved in World War II and we got absolutely annihilated by the Allies before we'd really built up a military. So the long and short of it is, here we are back at the start of the British Raj campaign. Once again we're going through this election season where we're trying to manipulate provinces to vote for us and I'm going to do things pretty much exactly the same as I did last time. We're going to be going down the left com route so we're creating a communist government that's going to be separate from the Comintern and slightly ideologically opposed to them. My main goal is to create some kind of faction that can pick up the scraps of World War II in such a way that we get Britain somehow. There's really no clear plan at this stage that's going to have to materialize as we go on. We win the election but a little bit less well than last time. So now we go into the independence mini game thing. Unfortunately, because we won the election a bit less well, we're barely gaining influence faster than the Muslim League. That means we're almost certainly going to lose Pakistan. Last time I tried everything to keep Pakistan and just about lost it, and this time the situation's worse, so we're almost certainly going to lose it. I think I actually didn't do any of them, because I just thought, we're going to lose it, let's not even try to keep it and just let them have it in the end, because it does save political power and allow us to make more appointments in our own government in the meantime. Now we come to the main big difference to what happened last time, this whole nobles issue. At first I thought maybe I'll just go with the concessions to the princes focus and we'll let there be a feudal nobility. But then I thought, well, that's very ideologically difficult for us as left comms to have these uh, feudal lords owning part of our territory. So I went for no concessions again, thinking somehow we'll find a way to beat them and not get involved in World War II in the process. It was actually by pretty much accident that I discovered what you're supposed to do here. It looked like I was trying to click on the button to open up our political screen, but I ended up on the decision screen and here noticed there's a bunch of decisions available at this stage where you can preemptively strike all of the prince's states and this will prevent them from rebelling against you. But it's also a gambling system of sorts. You have to spend some manpower and infantry equipment to do it, and sometimes it goes well, sometimes it goes badly, and that affects your long-term stability. Well, I just went through and tried to do it to all of them, and the long and short of my luck is that it was poor. We tended to get the bad results more than the good. I think it was balanced either way, so you're just as likely to get overall bad results as overall good results, and we were just a bit unlucky there. We lose so much infantry equipment doing these that I actually couldn't do them all one after the other as it turns out. If you get good results you don't lose as much equipment for doing them. But we couldn't produce equipment to keep up. Normally infantry equipment doesn't really matter that much, but we really are lacking for everything because you only start the game with like two or three military factories as the Raj. And on that note, one other difference to my current strategy compared to the failed strategy in the last part was that I've concentrated all of my newly built stuff towards the middle. Last time we had issues with the fact that Pakistan and Burma leaving the Raj will take all of their factories with them. This time, they don't have quite so many, so that will help out. Soon we're done raiding all of the princely states. This removes the princely states debuff that we had. I can't remember what it did, it was minus 33% something on a couple of different things. But whatever it was, it's gone, and that's good. Now we're going to cheekily pop off some independence, because we already had the influence to do it. We actually get a worse independence than last time, because if you have not quite so much of an influence difference between you and the Muslim League, you get to keep Kashmir, but this time that's gone to Pakistan, it's the area up off the top of the screen. But here we are, we're finally ourselves, it's time to start the campaign for real. Or is it because I was uh, tempted away by this intriguing tooltip when it says a noble way to guard minorities? Pakistan country changes to Pakistan. I was like, what does that do? Is this going to make Pakistan do something if I click on this? Well, the answer is it makes you into Pakistan. 
and that's not quite what I needed. So that's interesting though, you can switch to be a different country within the Raj later on, I guess that makes sense. Well played. We go back to an autosave and continue on down the Indian People's Republic route. As you can see my plan here, we need loads of military factories because we have an absolutely gigantic population, but we can't even come close to using it. We need loads more equipment before we can field big armies with our million available troops. And this is with no conscription whatsoever. We've got a volunteer army that's huge, but we can't use it. And we've got some more communist reforms to go down and complete the transformation into left com mode. We've also now got some action we can take against the United Kingdom. By going for the South Asian liberation focus, we can do some shenanigans, in particular here in Sri Lanka, we can try and make them get independence from the United Kingdom by smuggling in some guns and politically supporting the idea. Once you've done this enough times, it allows you to use a different focus which will force a rebellion, so this is separate to the usual coup system. But we are still going to be using that system because we need to think about our long-term strategy. We want to invade Britain itself, and that means we need a base nearby. Otherwise, we'd have to secure all of the sea route from India to Britain to make a naval invasion, and there's no way we'll be able to build a fleet that can do that. Plus, the fleet system is so annoying to control, I just don't want to. So instead, we're going to try and make Ireland into our base of operations. I was trying to be friendly with them, but I realized it's probably better to just turn them communist. We might be able to bring them into our faction and then use their territory as a springboard of some kind. They're not in the Allies, which is perfect, so we'll just leave that on the back burner. They might become communists later, and that might prove to be very useful. In the meantime, we've supported the Sri Lankan independence movement enough that we can now pop off the focus that will force them to become independent. There's no civil war or anything like that. It just removes the territory from the United Kingdom and creates a new faction right there. So boom, we have struck a blow against the UK. Now they don't have this area. Although I was stung a little bit by the fact that the new independent nation of Sri Lanka immediately joined the Axis. I was hoping they might be more aligned with me and we could together form some sort of faction. Instead, well, I suppose they just really hate the UK and have joined the Axis for that reason, because World War II is happening off somewhere. We're not paying too much attention to that right now. We do have some more shenanigans that we can get up to over here, because we have this focus that gives us a free war goal to conquer the two ports in India that are still controlled by the Europeans. We've got a French port on the right, and a Portuguese port on the left, which are just odd blemishes on our country right now. So yes, we can now get war goals against them. Although, the French one is technically part of the Allied faction, so that's a pretty big war goal to be taking on. I decided to actually look at World War II at some point. Luxembourg and Paris go down at the same time. Looks like Germany is invading France, it just keeps happening. Also, Italy is invading France. I think this is the main difference from the first part. There, Italy, for whatever reason, wasn't helping the Axis. So things are going a bit more normally this time. Looks like the Axis will be around. Maybe we'll want to keep in mind that we can still use the Axis to our advantage at some point. But because I'm aiming to create my own faction here, that's going to be less of an option. What I'm going to do for now is go after the Portuguese port of Goa, because Portugal isn't in the Allies or anything, they're just there. So it's just a fight against a single region for all intents and purposes. It's actually a special border war that works a bit differently to normal wars, which is to our advantage because it means we don't have to like go and conquer all of Portugal to claim this territory. We hit this decision that starts the border conflict they actually had no troops there, but for whatever reason there has to be a battle, I suppose. So we end up with this glitchy battle where we're not fighting anybody. Looks like we're winning, so our troops clearly are of the highest quality. They can enter unoccupied enemy territory like masters, although they're wasting quite a few bullets for uh, how few opponents we have to deal with to do this. Soon we're going to win that war. And then I did hesitate to go on and attack the other one because of the whole allied thing. 
even though it's such a tempting target. I actually set up and got to the point when I was about to do it, before I thought maybe we can't do this. The one possible thing that I was missing is that because this would be another war done through the decisions menu, it might not count as a declaration of war against their faction, so France might not be able to call in the rest of the allies to protect that area. So maybe I actually could have taken that place, but I was working under the assumption that I'd have to fight the allies as a whole in order to get that port. And Ireland isn't ready. I was thinking we could do it if we could immediately get to Ireland and start our shenanigans against the United Kingdom before they come and naval blockade us or something like that. But Ireland? Well, they've got a lot of communist support, but they're too stable to start a revolution. And as for their politics, they're being as neutral as possible and trying to stay out of things, which doesn't really suit our goals, unfortunately. One thing I realized we could do in the meantime, though, is ignore the whole France situation and instead attack Pakistan. We also have a focus that gives us the annex war goal against Pakistan for free. So we can just take all of their territory. They're not in a faction. And we're bigger than them, so we can probably defeat them if we just spam troops at them. And they're in a convenient place because we can recruit troops right next to them and just send them in. So we're going to pick up that war goal. We're also going to do this focus here, which will create the faction I've been going for. I'd spotted this focus ages ago, and that was part of the reason I wanted to still go down the left com route. We can make a specific left com faction that will be separate from the Comintern, and then we'll start pooling people together into it to make our joint coalition that I will then set against the Allies later. That's the overall plan. As you can see, we're set up, ready for the Pakistan operation right now. We're going to be doing something of a Schlieffen plan here. They've got that whole territory in the east, but we're going to ignore it and focus most of our troops on rushing to the west and only a very small part of the west. Most of the line, we don't have that many troops, so we're just going to stand there, although the enemy have no troops in some parts of their lines, we might as well advance. The main plan is happening down here near the coast. I've got this small group that's going to try and pull off an exploit. In the past, I'd realized that if you attack an enemy capital, the capital gets moved somewhere else, and thus the point from which they're being supplied moves somewhere else because of the game's quite weird supply system. So what we can do is try to exploit this by taking all of the territory around their capital, but not the capital. This will cause all of their territory to be out of supply all the time and make the war easier. That's the plan, at least. Having some difficulties here with the controls as I try to micro a few of the frontline units. We are able to make many decent advances just into open territory here. So maybe we don't need to be doing any sort of exploits. I think we can just straight up beat these guys, but we're trying it anyway since the opportunity is here. I'm also about to do the first ever supporting attack. I had this idea in the back of my mind that if you held shift or something, you could do a different kind of attack where you don't move into the territory you're attacking. I did it there for about one second when the blue arrow appeared, but I didn't actually want to do it. So that was the first and maybe the last time I'm going to use the supporting attack mechanic because I've already forgotten how to do it. I tried to do it in some other cases after this and couldn't get it to happen. I don't really know how it works. Anyway, the war is basically going to be fine because while I did pull off my whole surround the capital but don't take it thing, I don't think it had a big impact. But we have more troops than them, so maybe it doesn't matter. The left opposition faction has now been formed. So we are the opposition, I suppose, to the Comintern, technically, although we don't really care about the Comintern. I don't really know what we're supposed to be. I think it's some kind of libertarianism versus authoritarianism debate going on here, but in the realm of no privately owned means of production. Anyway, whatever's going on there... The plan is to eventually form our team of local South Asian communist states, which I might have to make myself with coups, and use them to our advantage. We do start with one such state already. It's Bhutan. They have very little military capacity and they're quite small, so that may not really help us at all. Well, it certainly won't help us at all. But it's nice to have somebody in the team, isn't it? So that's a start. We've got ourselves a faction here. Now we need to make something of it. The war continues on broadly successfully. We're pushing the fronts even without the enemy going out of supply. It does appear that this exploit doesn't work, or maybe because they have so few troops they can stay in supply because supplies are 
slightly generated by the cities outside of the capital. I still don't really know how it works, and I probably never will, but surrounding the enemy capital but not taking it doesn't appear to do anything particularly special, which I had speculated about in previous Hearts of Iron 4 series. Anyway, we just need to advance and win at this point. Casualties almost don't matter because we've got 2 million spare people, and we don't have guns for them, so we need to literally do the follow the guy with a rifle when he dies, pick up the rifle thing. I'd like to make more rifles, but to make rifles you have to make the rifle factory factories, which take a very long time, and just because we started so far behind economically, it's taking us ages to gradually get a military economy going. We've got enough artillery, at least, to have all of our regiments have two companies of artillery in them, all of our divisions I should say, whatever these divisions are supposed to be. We win that war then, and the result is that we just get everything since we were annexing them. Now our territory looks a little bit better, and we've got all these spare troops to do well, nothing much with as it happens. Over in Europe, France is gone, the Reich is taking over everything, so that's looking okay. I'm more interested in Irish politics. Annoyingly, they're still real stable. There was an election coming up, and communists are the largest political faction now, so it's possible they will elect themselves into being communist, and then I might be able to invite them to my faction due to our ideological links, or something. But that's going to take a while, and there's no guarantees of anything there, of course. So overall, the plan to do something with Ireland is kind of falling apart just because a lot of time has passed, we're not really getting anywhere. Possibly we need to come up with something else, but I didn't have any ideas. There was something I could do with my time though, and that was to look over to Central America, where we've got El Salvador, they want to join our left com faction. So I let them in, mainly so that I can join the war that they're currently in. They're fighting against Honduras to their east. We can now join this war and send troops over to conquer Honduras ourselves, with the objective of just having a base somewhere. That base would be slightly closer, I think, to the United Kingdom, so it's something. The other thing I was thinking about doing is attacking British Malaya, but they're in the Allies, so that wouldn't really help us out. It would get our war with the Allies started, but then I couldn't really go away from India after that, so I'm not sure how useful it would be. While poking around, the Bengal famine happened again. This time we actually get the option to ask Britain to help us, and I suppose what happens if you <laughs> click that is you lose all of your population or something, but we already know that Daddy Stalin has our back, even though this time we're explicitly opposed to Stalin, he probably doesn't like us, but he does end up giving us the famine, which gives us tons of relationship with the USSR, so we're not doing very well in our role as the left opposition. We seem to be working together with them, but hopefully nobody will notice. As for the Honduras war, it's going to be relatively easy because we can just send millions of divisions and overpower the enemy without too much strategy. In fact, I'm actually making a failed attack there. I eventually told them to not make that attack, I think, but it doesn't matter. We ended up winning and in the peace conference, we annex all of Honduras. I do have the player-led peace conferences mod installed, which I think is maybe a little bit broken. Normal peace conferences are a bit strange and people were recommending I get this mod, but the mod seems to let you just take way more than anyone else in the war, which is useful I suppose. So we grab all of that territory, even though it was a defensive war, they're just gone now Honduras. We'll occupy it, and as mentioned, this will be a useful base, potentially. I think it's closer to Europe, I'm not quite sure about that. But it's closer to other things, and the more bases you have around the places, the more options you have for potential things you can invade. So like, we could attack an island or something that the United Kingdom owns in order to start a war against them at this stage. As it happens though, there's nothing good we can do with this setup. One thing I was thinking about doing is like invading all of the nearby other small states, because we could certainly overpower them. But they're virtually all under the protection of the United States, they all have guaranteed independence. So that would also start a war with the Allies, and in particular the United States, and then they might come and overpower us, so we want to be careful. While we could match them in terms of our potential, they probably already have the factories and already have the guns, 
and could mobilize their population against us, so it's not like we're necessarily a weaker faction than any of the other superpowers, we just can't really get up to their level when it comes to producing military equipment. As for the Ireland plan, some developments have happened. Firstly, they've taken Northern Ireland back. This has caused them to lose a bunch of stability. Also, they've joined the Allies, which slightly ruins my plan, but doesn't necessarily matter if we get a rebellion to happen. And then being in the Allies will also reduce their stability. So we're starting to organize the coup there, and communism's super popular, so that's a good sign. And I've got a backup plan going, trying to get Portugal to do the same thing. So hopefully one of them will join our faction or something, will be able to use them as a springboard to have some operational potential in Europe, and then the reverse Raj plan might happen. Well, in the next part, we'll be seeing that by sheer accident, I do actually discover a way to get a serious base in Europe due to a variety of shenanigans. So join me for part three to see what that ends up being.